All right, everybody, we're cooking with fire. We're cooking with fire. All right, we are reading this very cool book, The Sword of Allah. And let me tell you something. It's literally too good. It's too good. Let's begin. We're on page 37, okay? Against the main body of the Muslims, Khalid was launching assault after assault with his squadron and doing severe damage. About now, he killed his second man, Saab bin Dahada, with his lance. In this battle, Khalid relied mainly on his lance, with which he would run down and impale his adversary. Ah, yeah. So you're on your horseback, you got your lance, and then you just pale them, just skewer them like a kebab. Every time he brought a man down, he would shout, Take that! And I am the father of Suleiman. I would probably say that as well. I wouldn't say who I'm the mother of, but I'd be like, Take it! Nah. At least that's what I say when I play video games. <laughs> the first rush of the counterattack passed and was followed by a lull in the Prophet sector. As the Quraysh withdrew a short distance to rest before resuming their attacks during this lull, one of the Muslims noticed that the Prophet was looking cautiously over his shoulder. The man asked the reason for this, and the Prophet replied casually, I am expecting Ubay bin Kalf. He may approach me from behind. If you see him coming, let him get near me. He had hardly said this when a man detached himself from Ikrama's squadron and slowly advanced towards the Prophet, mounted on a large, powerful horse. The man shouted, Oh, Muhammad, I have come. It's either you or me. Ooh, dang, I got a little bit of chills. If someone's telling you in that moment, like, it's you or it's me, it's like that person is letting you know one of us is going to die. And think about that from a psychological perspective. Imagine what it's like to hear someone tell you that, right? Someone's like, I'm literally going to die trying to kill you, right? If someone said that to me, I'd be like, huh. All right, we're going at it, you know what I mean? I probably wouldn't smile, but I'd be very freaked out. And then imagine the kind of force and energy to say that to someone, to let them know, right? Because you could be quiet and say, like, I'm just going to let you know, not let him get a warning of what I'm intending for him, right? So this person was very bold, and they're like, I'm going to tell this person I want to kill them, right? Think about that. Knowing that that would make the person you told rise up even higher to the occasion. Tells you a lot about the both, you know, angles of this. At this, some of the companions asked the prophet for permission to deal with the man. But the prophet said, let him be. The companions moved aside and left the way open for the rider to approach. At the Battle of Badr, a young man by the name of Abdullah bin Ubay not to be confused with Adullah bin Ubay, who was the leader of the hypocrites, was taken prisoner by the Muslims. His father, Ubay bin Kalf, came to release his son and paid 4,000 dirhams as ransom. Once the ransom had been paid and the young man released, while still in Medina, Ubay had been insolent to the Prophet. He had said, O Muhammad, I have a horse which I am strengthening with a lot of fodder. Because in the next battle, I shall come riding that horse and I shall kill you. Whew. Dude, this guy is like telling people, hey man, I'm going to even feed my horse some good fodder so it can come after you. Whew. And see, these war horses, they were very tolerant of noise and clamor. We forget this because we don't deal with a lot of horses, really. But they're not the they're not afraid ponies, if you know what I mean. The prophet had then replied, "No, you shall not kill me, but I shall kill you while you are on that horse, if Allah wills it." You see that? I like that because see, he says, "I shall kill you," and then finishes it with, "If Allah wills," right? It's like. He gives a threat, but knows not to get arrogant and be like, it's not just my internal will which will manifest this end goal, but it's from a 
divine will in a sense, right? Destiny is all. The man had laughed scornfully as he rode away with his son. And now Ubay bin Kalf was approaching the prophet on his horse. He saw the companions move out of the way. He saw the prophet waiting for him, and grudgingly he admired the man he had set out to kill. You know, there's some people who you probably would feel like that with, right? Without a doubt. The prophet was wearing two coats of mail. He wore a chain helmet, the side flaps of which covered his cheeks. Oh, cool, I know those kind of helmets. His sword rested in its sheath, tucked into a leather belt, and his right hand held his spear. Ubay noticed the powerful broad shoulders of Muhammad, noticed the large hard hands, hands strong enough to break a spear in two. You know what's interesting? Okay, so back then, those people, definitely a lot stronger than the soy boys we have today, but... I've had somebody who punched me in my arm once, and this person used to work hard labor on the fields in Mexico. And this dude had skinny arms. Not skinny, but he didn't have, like, the muscle, beefy, super jacked, you know, mid-head, yoked uh, body structure. And when he punched me in my arm, man, it was, like, solid, like, oh, man, like, there's some punch there, like, density in them bones. So when he says hard hands... I know exactly what he's talking about. Not in maybe into the degree of the desert strongness, but a sort of rural strongness of someone who's endured the elements and had to do hard labor. How strong their hands become, you know what I'm saying? The Prophet looked a magnificent sight. It is known to few people today that Prophet Muhammad was one of the strongest Muslims of his time. Add to his great personal strength, the fact of divine selection, and one can imagine what a formidable opponent he would have proved to anybody. But Ubay was undaunted. He had just killed a Muslim and his spirits were high. The Prophet could easily have told his companions to slay Ubay. They would have fallen upon him and torn him to pieces. Or he could have given Ali the simple order, kill that man, and that man would be as good as dead. For when Ali set out to kill a man, nothing could save him. But the Prophet had ordered his companions to stand aside. This time, he wanted no help from anyone. This was a matter of personal honor, a matter of chivalry. Indeed, right? Indeed. Muhammad would fight alone as a chivalrous Arab. Yeah, that's cool, right? He would keep his rendezvous with a challenger. I like the way he used that. He's using a, you know, that sort of westernized conception of chivalry to an, to an Arab you know it's that's pretty cool as a rider right as Ubay reached the Prophet he pulled up his horse he was in no hurry not for a moment doubting that Muhammad would await his attack he took his own time over drawing his sword and then suddenly it was too late for the Prophet raised his spear and struck at the upper part of Ubay's chest it's like <clears throat> Oh, no, upper part. Oh, I see. Ubay tried to duck, but was not quick enough. The spear struck him on the right shoulder, near the base of the neck. So let's see right here. Somewhere right here. It was a minor wound, but Ubay fell off his horse. Ooh, <laughs> that's a hard fall, man. Onto the ground. And in the fall, broke a rib. Yeah, I bet. Ooh. Dude, can you imagine the pain? Just like a cracked rib, you fell off the horse. The smell of that horse just farting as it leaves. Oh, man. Before the prophet could strike again, Ubay had risen and turned tail, running screaming towards his comrades. They stopped him and asked how he had fared, to which Ubay replied in a trembling voice, By Allah, Muhammad has killed me. The Quraysh examined his wound and then told him not to be silly because it was a superficial wound which would soon heal. Ubay's voice rose higher as he said, I shall die. When the Quraysh tried to console him further, Ubay lost all control over himself and in a frantic voice screamed, I tell you I shall die. Muhammad had said that he would kill me. If Muhammad were to just spit on me, I would dip. Ubay remained inconsolable. When the Quraysh returned to Mecca, he went with them while they were camped at a place called Saraf. Whoa. 
not far from Mecca. The wretched man died. The cause of his death was certainly not the physical effect of the wound, and Allah knows best. Uh, I like how he uh, I like how he ended that like yeah, Allah knows best is like let you know. The situation gradually became more desperate as the Muslims held on grimly and showed no sign of breaking up. Abu Sufyan and Khalid both wanted a quick decision. The battle had long gone on and up. The Quraysh therefore decided to press harder and if possible get at the Prophet as his death would have the probable effect of ending resistance. A lot of people think that yeah that a movement is dead once you take out the their leader however history has shown it just creates a vacuum and someone else steps up to the plate so yeah a strong group of Quraysh infantry consequently advanced against the Prophet the Muslims defenders continued to fight and many of them were cut down three of the Quraysh managed to break through the cordon and got within stone throwing distance of the Prophet got within stone throwing distance so far enough to where if you were gonna chuck a stone, you'd, you'd definitely get at the Prophet. These three men were Utba bin Abi Waqas, Abdullah bin Shahab, and Ibn Kaimaya. They all began to hurl stones at the Prophet. Oh, so they literally did throw stones! Oh! Because he's like, oh, they got in within a stone throwing distance of the Prophet. I thought it was like a clever way of measuring distance, but apparently they actually did throw stones. Uh, wait, is this the part where he gets his, he gets a tooth knocked out or something? I forgot. The first, a brother of Saad landed four stones on the prophet's face, broke two of the yeah 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 it is, broke two of the prophet's lower teeth and cut his lower lip. Man, it hurts. Mm. Abdullah managed to land one stone which gashed the prophet's forehead. While Abin Kaima was with one stone cut the prophet's cheek and drove two links of the prophet's chain helmet into his cheekbone. I remember that from the sealed nectar. I think it was sealed nectar. Oof. Jagged rocks being hurled. It's very painful, man. Ouch. Uh, 